sometimes when I'm feeling really lost. I go to church. Yes, I go to church. Why do people go to church? I don't go to church. Some churches just want your money. Uh, religions separate people. question uh why do people go to church well i think people go to church because they um they want to get close to god and they just feel like you know this is how we're going to talk to god and i'd say i I've, I've seen especially with things like easter and christmas and those types of really big holidays it almost seems like people do go kind of out of guilt of like oh i'm supposed to go so i should go because something about jesus is going on so i might as well go to church what do you think churches uh, really want from people? I think the say if you're speaking of the organized religious right in this country, I think it wants power. It wants control over people. It, it wants numbers. It wants bodies. I think I think church just wants to create a place where people can come together and worship and feel safe. I'm really not much of a church person, so I wouldn't know, but I'd say it's for the community mostly, is to help other people. In your opinion, are churches a good thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, church as, as a church are a good thing. It's just the people who um, end up becoming the leaders, they, they, all, they need to be good people, and that doesn't often happen. Church in and of itself is a great thing. It's just a matter of people distorting what it's supposed to be. I think having a spiritual understanding is, is excellent, and I think there are many teachers out there that you could get that from, and it's up to you as an individual to go out and educate yourself and to learn from Jesus and Buddha and, you know, all these teachers from our past that had, you know, you know good things to say about how to live your life. Why do you think people should help churches? Why do I think people should help churches? Because it's a, it's a strong influence in the community. It's definitely something that does good. It's not, I mean, that's not people that are going to be putting drugs in the streets or causing kids to do bad in school. You know, it's definitely a good influence. So any good influence that we can get on top of all the bad things that are out there is definitely important and needs to be supported. They benefit more from helping the church out. But, you know, the church could be using them. You know, the church could be using their their time, power, money for their own um, greed, you know, a church could get something out of it, and you know, the thing nowadays is you don't know about it. I mean, the, the, the reverend or the priest can keep you, he, your eyes shielded from what, what really goes on, because you really don't know what goes on uh, through those doors. Um, do you go to church, and if so, what is your involvement? Um, I go to church, um, I'd say occasionally, not necessarily frequently, and um, just um, I try to support the, the youth groups mostly. Just I think that uh, it gives a very um, strong value base, and they need that. Kids nowadays need that as much as possible. Very peripheral. Uh, we, we show up once in a while. My involvement with a church is to try to understand the word and to try to get it out to to teach the word because that's what he wants us to do he wants us to learn it and he wants us to be a living testimony go to church usually when i need some kind of guidance or support and you know one of my faults is that whenever i feel like oh i don't need church i don't go and you said you don't go to church no i haven't for i mean i have a couple times with my family because there's a lot of my you know, family members are religious, and I do go with them to be respectful, and I don't have anything against it, but it's not exactly for me. I don't go to church. Uh, no, I don't go to church. All right, well, hey, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here today. Thanks for coming. Uh, I like that video because it, it represents something that I think is really true. Um, I think today that uh, that people don't have a problem with God, and I'll explain that in just a minute. 
But we as a church, the church, uh, there's some doubt there. There's some things that did not equated quite correctly. And so as I was thinking about today's message, and I was thinking about uh, some things I want to share with you a little bit later, I saw this video and I thought, you know what? Those are some honest uh, evaluations of what people think. And I also believe that uh, as, as you listen to that, you sense the doubt in it. Like you sense the, the questioning, like it's a good thing, but I'm not so sure about it, uh, the church. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that here today. Uh, so, so thanks for just kind of engaging in that. And also, I want to thank you here today. Uh, uh, last week, I was gone. Uh, thanks to Pastor Lawrence for filling in for me last week. Did a great job. Give it up for L. Uh, Pastor L, sorry. Uh, this side liked L. Sorry, Lawrence. This side didn't like you very much. Uh, but, but thanks so much for him doing that. And um, uh, I was in, just so you know, I was in Atlanta last week. I was, uh, I'm part, I'm a serve as on the board of directors of the organization called Momentum. And Momentum is the organization that is really about developing leaders, but uh, if you've heard of our you know, youth conference or national youth conference our kids go to and things like that, um, that's the organization that puts them on. Uh, and then I serve as a, I serve as a coach of other pastors uh, through Momentum, and this meeting was about that. And so um, I was able to, to enjoy some time with some uh, with some people of, of like-mindedness and, and the church. And so thanks for releasing me to go. Appreciate that so much. Uh, but I miss being here. It was a pretty grueling couple, couple of days. So uh, it's good to be back. And I was um, excited about today's uh, message. By the way, if you're brand new, welcome to you. We're so thankful that you're here. I pray that you've had a good experience so far. We've prepared for your arrival, we hope. So make sure you say hi to me uh, afterwards, okay? So we're, gonna, we're in week five here, believe it or not, of uh, the doubt that I feel. Uh, and um, I'm amazed, again, I say this often, but I'm amazed at uh, some of the responses from people working through the reality of doubt. We all have it. And uh, how are we supposed to handle it? How are we supposed to work through it? and so forth. And so I cannot believe we're in week five already. We have a couple more weeks after this. And today what I'm going to talk about, so the video kind of led into it, is uh, we're going to talk about um, religion and uh, are all religions the same? They kind of are, right? It's kind of what people say in, um, in the world here today. And so I doubt, uh, you know, about what you're saying you believe because they're all kind of the same. That's kind of the idea here today. It's interesting to me when I watch sports. I watch a lot of sports. I spent the day yesterday going back and forth between golf and, uh, and some college basketball. I love doing that. Uh, and I love watching the interviews afterwards. A lot of people turn it off and go to bed or turn it off and do something else. But I love to watch it because I'm waiting to hear what the stars or the coaches, or whoever, uh, what they say. And uh, a lot of times you'll hear a coach or a, or a star of the, of the game say, I just want to thank God for this. And when you hear someone say, thank God, you're like, oh, that's great. Yay, he thanked God, right? That's really neat. Everybody's like giving him a round of applause or her. But if they say, hey, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, like the music changes, doesn't it? It's different. It's different when someone actually uses the name Jesus and uses the name God. And somehow in our culture, and I believe because of the power of the name of Jesus, uh, when we say God, it's okay because it's a general term. But when you give glory to Jesus, something changes and you are identifying in a different way. And you be, kind of become radical, you kind of become this like, almost kind of a weirdo for saying those kinds of things because that alienates you from the rest of religion. It's really interesting. I want to kind of talk about that today. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to John chapter 14. Uh, we're going to be in the book of John. I'm going to kind of go back and forth in different passages here today. But John 14 is our base text. And I want us to look at this because it's in this text that Jesus does a couple of things. Jesus is talking to his disciples. We actually looked at part of this in the very first week when we looked at Thomas, who was, doubt, who was doubting. But uh, in this passage, Jesus does a couple, like, as I said, a couple things. He encourages people. He says, hey, listen, I'm for you. I'm with you. We're going to be together forever. I'm preparing rooms. It's good. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. And then he says, but you also need to understand something about me that as I'm going to do these things for you, you need to understand who I am and what, 
what I represent, who I represent. And he makes an exclusive claim about himself that we're going to look at. So John chapter 14, we're going to read verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to talk about a lot here today. All right, get it? Good, all right. Let's, let's go. I think it's up here on the screen for you. It says this. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, 14.1. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have, uh, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Which is really good news. Guys, don't be discouraged. Guys, don't be afraid. Guys, listen. If I'm here and I leave, you need to know that I'm not forgetting about you. You need to know that as you walk into the ministry that I'm preparing you for and calling you to, it's going to be scary. It's going to be hard. It's going to be sacrificial. It's going to be real. It's going to be like, like difficult. But don't you be discouraged because where I'm going, you're going to go to. Don't lose heart, he said. Don't be troubled. Verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, verse 6, and here's the exclusive claim that I want us to see. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it is that exclusive claim that changes the music whenever a celebrity or an athlete says, I thank God versus thanking Jesus. Jesus had an exclusive claim about himself. And because he is Jesus, it changes the music in the room. Okay? Let's move on. Verse 7. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And he's speaking about himself. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after, I've, even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on the uh, evidence of the works themselves. So Jesus makes that exclusive claim. We'll go back to that in a little bit. And he says, listen, uh, basically, I'm not a religion. I'm different. And yet we come back today, and I think they're good questions. We come back today, and I, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about why I think maybe the the, the movement of the church over the past 70 years or so have added to these doubts that we're having, okay? But Jesus is saying that, that I am the way, and we say, uh, and I've heard it over and over and over again, is that one of the questions that people wrestle with when it comes to religion is, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, and the reason that is what matters is because all religions are basically the same. That's kind of what people are saying, right? And so they doubt when people say, use the name Jesus. So let me just give you an overview because we're gonna see here that religions actually aren't all the same. And I'm gonna give you a very, 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 very high level uh, understanding of some, some primary religions in the world, including Christianity. I'm just gonna kind of rattle these off, okay? All right, uh, they're not the same. Let's just take Buddhism, for example. A Buddhist would believe that there is no God and that there's no type of final existence. They would believe in what we call annihilation. We just cease to exist. Uh, and yet there are still countless rebirths um, and ongoing cycles, right? And so I, you come back and reincarnation, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's what they believe, not really a God that we are continuing to, um, you know, whatever, all right? Hinduism Okay, Hinduism is different as well. Uh, it has a God, but it's an impersonal God. Uh, and you approach that impersonal God through deities and statues and idols. 
I remember when we were in Cambodia, we've been to Cambodia four times, uh, there would be these different places all over, and, and there'd be there were Buddhists and Hindu represented there. We would, we would see all these statues and people going to these idols and statues. Uh, I remember uh, in their religion over there that we would be sitting uh, at a restaurant eating, and there would be a full meal underneath a statue because they would come out and they believed and they were feeding right the spirit right and and so there was this belief right uh that god is impersonal but you approach this impersonal god through statues and idols right and if you take buddhism and hinduism together which often are kind of lumped into some of the same beliefs uh there's no forgiveness of sins uh, in this and these uh, religions, uh, there's no real supernatural help, only karma, and a lot of you know that, uh, which actually seems to be a pretty real thing, and that's actually quoted a lot in our culture today, right? Uh, if you do this, then this is going to happen. You either have good karma or you have bad karma, and we say it kind of like a social thing, almost. But there is this underlining belief system that you get what you deserve. It's either good or it's bad. Right? There's this, and we say, do you hear it? It's karma. Well, that comes from a belief system, right, that, uh, that you get back good for what you do good, and you get back bad for what you do bad. There's no forgiveness of sins, okay? Um, then there's this, uh, there's Muslim, and Muslim is, is something that you hear a lot about uh, as well. There is a God, they worship Allah. Okay, Allah is their God, and uh, who is a personal God. There's no secondary gods uh, in this religion. Uh, there's a total ban on idols, and so you just keep all your statues out of here, right? Don't waste your money on those things. Um, and what about your standing with this God? Well, it depends upon your religious devotion, okay? How devoted are you? It depends upon your faithfulness. It depends upon, here it is, ready? Your good works, and in a very real way, all of those religions together, at the end of the day, are about good works. You get what you deserve, good or bad, right? You get a second life, right? You reincarnate, and depending on what you were before is what you get later, and you're, you know, right? And then there's the karma, like all those things. At the end of the day, there's this idea of, right, I get what I deserve. There's no forgiveness of sins. There's, it's my faithfulness and devotion to things. It's dependent on me. What about, uh, this is an old one too, but uh, it came to light uh, really heavy, probably back in the 80s where it became like really a, a big religion, uh, the New Age movement. Uh, this, this underlies much of what you hear in culture today, very much without you even realizing it. Um, there's no personal God. Um, in the New Age movement, uh, you're trying to seek a higher consciousness. Um, I think this is huge uh, in uh, the celebrity entertainment world today. They're trying to reach this level of consciousness uh, in their lives, right? Uh, becoming one with the universe or the cosmos, right? We're just, we're part of this whole thing. And so it's a, it's a spiritual movement, right? And and um, all, all these roads lead to a mountaintop, and, and, and God is on the mountaintop, and we find our own way there, and we become one with, with what is there. Does that make sense? Get it? Okay, again, this is high level, I know that, uh, but there's this idea are, that all religions are the same. Well, they're not. They're actually quite different, okay? Uh, and then you have Christianity, um, Christianity believes in a personal God. We just read from Jesus, uh, who loves his people unconditionally. For God so what? Love the what? World. God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. This side over here is like, I'm with you. This side's like, I don't know, Jason. I, I just don't know. Right? That, 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 that he gave. And so God is a personal God. He loves his people unconditionally, so much so that he became one of them in the person of Jesus and sacrificed his life for what? The forgiveness of sins. 
And those sins could not be atoned for by yourself. We needed a sacrifice, and Jesus was willing to do that. He became a personal God, walked on the earth, gave up his life for us, and he said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And this Jesus is so good that not only did he come, he said, I'm gonna take you with me someday, and we have a relationship together, and everything is built upon me. So it's not just God in general, I am God, but I am the one that has come so that you might have the forgiveness of sin. It's personal. It's Jesus. So what we have to do, if you'll permit me today, I think we have to acknowledge that although it feels good in culture, and a lot of times it's because we're not really sure how to make the distinction between all of them, it feels good in culture to say that all paths lead to God, all religions are basically the same, but the truth is they're not. They're different. And there's belief systems in those things. So that's actually not a very good statement to make. They don't all lead to the same thing. And only Jesus is the one that says, I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. I am God. I have come. By the way, when you see that Jesus says that, uh, that he has come into the, I came into the world, if he came into the world, uh, Tim Keller talks about this. If Jesus came into the world, it means that he was already existing in another place. Okay, so he came to the world. God, he was already God. He was there in the beginning, the Bible says. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Speak the Word, meaning Jesus. So Jesus came. He already existed. He didn't begin to exist when he was here on earth. He existed. God has always been. Jesus has always been. Okay? Understand that. So important. And so what I want us to do today is I want to invite you to just consider Jesus. Just Jesus. And guys, I, one reason I showed you that video about the church is I'm not talking about considering church because um, our church, let's just talk about Western Reserve, our church doesn't get everything right. <laughs> We get a lot wrong. I'm not asking you to consider Christians because we definitely don't get it right as Christians. Because when I look at Christians today, and I, I'm a pastor, so I can say this, I think, um, some are, many Christians, some are ridiculously loving and full of grace and extremely generous. And then there are some Christians that I just don't want to claim sometimes. And I tell you, hey, if you're going to do that, don't tell them you come here. It's one of my statements, isn't it? We don't want to claim sometimes other believers. Because believers, Christians can be, and listen to me, I love you, but it's true. We can be very, very hateful. We can be narrow-minded. We can be critical. We can be judgmental. We can be full of dogma. By the way, when I say dogma, what do I mean? Dogma is a set of beliefs that are not to be questioned. And there are things that we believe that, that are absolute foundations because of what the Bible says. It's absolutely true. But dogma says that you're not really allowed to doubt. You're not really, really allowed to work through things and ask questions. And so we, we are not dogmatic, but we are very much confident in what God has said in this Bible. And we want to consider those things together. Okay? And so we're do Christians can be dogmatic. Um, and can, can I just be honest with you? I'm just going to be honest, right? You might leave the church now. I don't know. We'll see. But the truth is this. In some of the circles and churches that I have been in and see, the people there would not push me toward Jesus, but actually, and frankly, potentially push me toward religion, not Jesus. And maybe that's you here today. So I don't want you to look at people. I hope that we can continue to be a reflection of Christ and be humble. I hope that's something that we can be. Uh, we had the chance to visit on the way home this week the Billy Graham Library. It was an incredible visit. Marcia had a great time doing that. And uh, while we were there, um, one of at his funeral, one of his uh, daughters said, uh, my dad was not God, but I sure saw a good picture of God in my dad. You know, and, and so, like, she was saying that he wasn't perfect. And so, but yet she saw what attributes of God had how he had changed his life 
And so my prayer is that as people that we, we honestly say we're imperfect, but we have seen Jesus transform us, okay? But ultimately, we want you to look at Jesus, not people, okay? Um, you probably don't heard a pastor even say things uh, like, you know, the way Christians can be judgmental and things like that. Um, but here's what's interesting. This is why I want to go the way that I'm going, all in the context of Jesus being the only way uh, to the Father and himself. Um, 40 million people have left the church in the past 25 years. 40 million people. I'm reading a church right now called, or a book right now called The, um, the Great Dechurching. <laughs> like, I could have helped them with the title of that book, by the way, but that's what they chose. 40 million people in 25 years. Why do you think there are thousands of people who do not really know what they believe and a lot of them grew up around Christians? Why is that? Because I think sometimes we take the truth of the Bible and we focus on one part and not the whole. Or we preach and teach the shame of the gospel and not the true gospel. We tend to teach behavior and not transformation. We judge others' behavior and we judge ourselves by our own hearts is what we do. So if you're here, I want you to know that I'm not preaching church, but you do need to know that we're trying to build a church where the above isn't true. I want to preach Jesus and him crucified and risen in Jesus alone. But what I wanna do, because this is a series of doubt, is I just want to have this conversation with you. And so what I did here was I, what, what I sought to do is, was offer you two frames today. And the first frame was to understand that even though people say that all you need to be is really sincere because all religions uh, tend to be the same, uh, I wanted to give you a biblical frame as to the, the fact that they're not and that Jesus is different. He's made the exclusive claim. And we're going to return to that in just a minute. Okay, that was frame number one. Frame number two, what I want to do is I want to talk about our doubts and ask the question, why is it, why is it that we doubt whether God is who he says he is, or even just simply doubt, you know, what to believe and where to go and what to think? And I'm going to do something a little different. And again, I think because of my unique role, I think I can talk to you this way, kind of explain to you things that I've learned over the years, um, and how it has added to the confusion and the doubt of the current generation when it comes to church and ultimately Christ, okay? So this is frame number two, okay? Um, let's go back 40 to 75 years, okay? Boomer and Gen X generations. We have some boomers in here. Gen X generations, of course, are in here as well. During this generation of church, uh, mega churches weren't a thing. It wasn't until the 1970s that the megachurch really began to make its way, where it became known, right? Today, you feel like it's all megachurches and, and so forth, but, but, and those aren't bad. I'm just saying that they weren't a thing back then. Did you know this? Did you know that the Akron Baptist Temple, back in those days, uh, was the largest church in America? It's no longer there anymore, <laughs> but it was. Uh, and so I remember going to a concert there uh, and learn his massive place and learning that that was true at one point. Um, but back then it was huge. Uh, now, uh, why weren't mega churches a, a big deal back then? Well, because church existed in the small towns of America. Uh, I remember driving into small towns and there would be a sign going into small towns and it would be uh, the churches of yada yada right, right not really a place uh yada yada welcome you and it would have a, a, a sign of each church that was in there and we were back then as a culture driven more by denominationalism and so you were a baptist or you were a presbyterian or you know you right that's what you were and so you would come into a town and you would go to that type of church and it was more about belonging to a uh, denomination than it was just the church okay uh, back then, I talked about this last spring when I did the reserve nights. Um, some of this is that the church uh, was prevalent in our culture. 
uh, during that time. Uh, it had authority. Uh, the, the leaders were trusted. Uh, the church was trusted. Culturally, back then, people believed in God. Culturally, of course, there were exceptions. Uh, everything about God uh, seemed to be wrapped up in little boxes. And so we believe this about God, we believe this about God, we believe this about God, and we believe this about God. And we defined it, and we, we, we drew structures around it, and we drew belief systems because of those structures. They were, and here's a big word, systematized. A systematic theology began to be a thing back then, okay? Um, back then, people didn't question much. And this is the truth. It was truth, and if you doubt, then you didn't have the faith that you needed. That's kind of how it was, All right? Now, let me share with you a positive about that generation of church of which um, my parents came to Christ in, and then I grew up in this thought process, right? Uh, let me share with you a positive before I paint some shortcomings, because every church generation had it. The church 40 to 75 years ago did teach the Bible. They did. Um, I trusted my Lord and Savior at 12 years old because my pastor got up and preached the Bible. He preached the gospel, and I responded to Christ. So I'm very thankful for that generation and the way they taught it. But some of the execution is where some of the uh, discouragement happened, and we see a change in just a minute. Right, So some of the negatives were. The church in that generation, some of you will give me an amen, don't give me an amen because that's mean, uh, but the church in that generation was known for what it was against, not what it was for. The church in that generation was more known for what it was against than what it was for. That's just true, okay? I remember uh, they were against alcohol, okay? Uh, they were against movies, and they were against dancing, all right now i've danced up here on stage in front of you so i'd really be in trouble back then okay and if you were a woman coming to serve you could serve as long as it was in the children's ministry anything secular i remember they were against anything secular i remember when i was a kid someone took a secular song and replaced some of the words with god words and sang it in special music it was kind of like a a spiritual weird out Yankovic kind of thing <laughs> going on. And I remember thinking, that's just dumb. I just remember thinking that. That's just weird, okay? Now here's what happened. The church before me and then the my generation, um, and I was gonna say something bold, I'm just being honest. They didn't serve as ambassadors of Jesus. They served as gatekeepers, because they were more about what they were against than what they were for, okay? I don't think they meant to, truly. And I'm a, I'm a product of all of that, okay? But they served as gatekeepers, not ambassadors to culture. They were known more for keeping people out, not inviting people in. And by the way, there are still churches that exist today that are like that, okay? And I love them. We're on the same team. It's just different, okay? Because of that, because of that, um, there was a shift then that happened in the 80s and the 90s, right? And uh, it was when, the, when a huge pendulum swing took place, okay? They were here in this huge, I'm not talking about preaching the word or Jesus, right? This execution of church happened and it shifted the pendulum all the way to one side, Okay, and mega churches began to be a reality. Okay, uh, the seeker sensitive movement hit the hit the streets, um, hit churches. It was ushered in by big leaders like Bill Hybels and and Rick Warren, godly men that led the churches in an, in a great way in some ways. Uh, well, they sought to tear down the gates and become true ambassadors of Christ. What they sought to do. Uh, when they did this, the pendulum swung all, swung all the way to the other side. I was influenced greatly by these men in ministry. Now, let me say something good. Uh, this movement was highly evangelistic, highly evangelistic, and people came to know Jesus in droves 
That's why these churches just became unbelievably huge and powerful. Mega churches began to take root, and the entire landscape of the church shifted. It shifted. It wasn't about any longer what denomination you were a part of. Certainly, you had people that said they were, but it was more about being part of a good church, about part, being part of a Bible teaching good church. Okay? Um, what was the church known for? Still had, uh, still had God um, broken down, still, like the previous generation, God in systematic boxes that made sense. They took everyday life struggles and answered them from the Bible. They were spiritual surgeons that taught us what a healthy marriage looked like, what healthy finances looked like, and how to raise good children. They were the answer churches. They answered the questions that you had. They used the Bible to answer cultural questions. I remember visiting a church in Indiana, and before the service started, they stated that this was going to be a PG-13 service. And if you didn't want your kids to hear what was going to happen in church, get them out. I remember thinking, man, church has changed. <laughs> not good, not bad, just the way that it was, okay? It was felt need driven. Now, here's what happened. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be critical, I'm just gonna be honest. Sin was lost in translation. Um, the Bible fixed our problems rather than showing us the glory of God. And that was never the intent of people like Rick Warren and Bill Hybels. It was pastors like me that messed it up, okay? My generation messed that up. They didn't mess that up. And we began to preach something that was true and right, but we missed the foundation of the gospel and sin and the difference that Jesus makes in people's lives versus the using the Bible to meet a felt need. Does that make sense? Get it? Good. <laughs> I like this side a lot today. All right. Um, then, okay, by the way, this is all, remember, on the context of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, we frame that, right? And, and then, but there's people with doubts today, and I'm not sure they can trust the church. And then, then the spiritual generation of the 2000s entered the scene. Let me say, show you some positives about this generation that's now leading the church, okay? This generation pushed us to think again, taught us to consider the deeper things of God, they led us back to heartfelt worship. Worship in the 2000s became unbelievable. Unbelievable. They taught us that emotions aren't bad, but can unlock a deep relationship with God. It doesn't just have to be systematic, but you can bring everything about you to God. In this generation, questions, not answers, were king. And auth authenticity was paramount. You couldn't talk about or consider God to be in a box. And in this, all the lines were erased. And so it went from box to box to box to, I want to leave the room with more questions than answers. Another major shift. It happened in ours a little bit. I remember talking to a, uh, to a young intern and they wanted to lead a Bible study. We were sitting with our elders, and they said, I want to lead this Bible study. We said, okay, what do you, like, what's your goal? What do you want to do? And they, they said, I want the success for me is going to be when we end our Bible study that they're, this is a Bible study. They leave the Bible study with more questions than answers. I thought our elders were going to grab them by the neck and throw them down <laughs> for good reason. Okay? But that's what they were saying was paramount. They didn't want either previous generation, Gen Xers or Boomers, to impact their thinking. They didn't want the message of sin and hell and judgment preached. Uh, they didn't want the Bible fixers to tell them how to repair their lives either. They didn't want any part of it. They didn't want anybody telling them what to do. I often, there was a, during this time, there was a rise of, of reformed theology, and that's not new, it's very old, but this generation kind of went into Reformed theology and it had a huge rise. And um, I have told people one of the reasons that it became so huge in this generation because this generation wouldn't allow anyone but God to tell them what to do. And in Reformed theology, it was very much all about God saying things. Uh, 
No longer did the idea exist that to be a Christian, you had to be a Republican. Whoops. This generation of church opened the gates and said, let's consider everything, and then we'll make our own decision. This is where deconstructionism began to happen in the church. Spiritual dogma was dead. And there exists today a spiritual cold war between dogmatic churches of America and then I have a lot of questions movement in America. On one side, you have God and country, somewhat militant Christians fighting for their rights. And on the other side, you have what I call sociology Christians who invite a good debate on the issues but won't draw hard lines. And now we have a new generation stuck between these two chasms, in my opinion, this is just Jason's opinion, stuck between these two chasms of belief. They grew up with the 40 million adults who have left the church in the past 25 years. And now we have a generation today that's wrestling with some of the issues in culture, things like gender identity and mental health issues. Those are issues that the church needs to work through and address. And, a, and culture doesn't just see, today's culture doesn't just see the church as intolerant, but they see us as uncivilized because we can't sit down and have honest conversations. We don't know what to do with it. And for many, we don't seek to understand. And so whenever you don't seek to understand something or you don't understand something, we fear it. And when we fear it, when that happens, you begin to fight it and judge it rather than love and try to understand where they're coming from. And all of this is in the context, let me remind you, that Jesus is the only way to the Father. All roads do not lead to God. There is no such thing as karma. We believe in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. We believe and know that we are sinful by birth and we continue to sin. We keep doing things against the heart of God. And the only way that we can be redeemed is through the blood and commitment to Jesus Christ. And it's our faith in him that we are justified and made right. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what we believe and we know. But we've got to be a church that helps people get there and understand it. And we might come today and we might doubt because of this world. We might doubt because my life hasn't worked out. We might doubt because hardship has come. But many doubt because the church seems to be doing things to make itself ineffective. And I don't want us to be that way as a church. And so you come in today, some of you come in, and you see that video about the church, and you're considering, you know, really who God is and, and, and what he has done, and what, how does my life matter as a result, and, and like, is it different than other religions? Like, like, where am I? My response is, as I look at the landscape of church over the past 70 years, and I see this generation facing the things that it's facing, I look at you and say, I can see why you doubt. Because the church has had an identity crisis for years. And we can't have an identity crisis. And we need to allow people to come and to question and to work through the things that we know to be true. And so what do we first do? And let me tell you something of your doubt. I just want you to know, with all encouragement that I can give and with all authority that I might have in your life, if any at all, I would tell you to return to the person that was central to all things that we just talked about. You see, churches messed it up, but none of them stopped preaching Jesus. It just got covered up a little bit. And it shouldn't have. 
And there have been times where we have been intolerant. There have been times where we have been militant. There have been times where we haven't represented Christ the way that he wants to be represented. But I want to invite you and encourage you with all of my encouragement to return to the person, Jesus. Religion is not the answer for this life and eternity. Bring your doubts. But the answer is Jesus. 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 In John 14, our passage that we read earlier and I framed with you, Look what he does in verses one through three. I've already talked about it. Let me just review it again. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled, guys. Don't be afraid. Don't let your doubts overcome you. Lean into them. Seek me out. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. I'm the one. It's not just, oh, I just thank God for my ability. No, no, I also believe in Jesus because he's the one that came and died for me. In my father's house, it has many rooms, if we're not so. And he says this, I would have told you where I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me that you're gonna be where I am also. That's a personal, loving God that wants you to know that in your doubts, listen, believe in me. Start with me. I'm the one. And then John 4, if you go back just a few chapters, John chapter 4, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end, end on time here. You're welcome. All right. John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, he said... Um, I used to know where John was. Here it is. Okay. He's talking to the woman at the well. He says this in 7 through 10. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. In other words, we don't talk to one another. Right? Just think about that. Can, Can I just put it in our own vernacular today? We come from different religions. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who who, who it was that asked you for a drink, you uh, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Hop down to verse 13. Everyone, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water Uh, will be thirsty. He's referring to the water in the well. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring welling up to eternal life. In other words, listen, what we are drinking in in our culture, what we are lapping up in our different considerations, that will cause you to continually thirst But when you really say, Jesus, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to give you my life through faith that when I do that, you're no longer looking to be fulfilled by different religions, by different works, by different uh, karma and all these things that aren't true. Jesus is the one that will fill you with life. That's his promise to the woman at the well. And this woman, don't miss this, had committed sins that she didn't believe she could ever come back from. You ever been there? Culture had treated her as an outcast. She came to the well by herself because the other women would not associate with her. She had come face to face, don't miss it, with religion, face to face with her regrets. She lived with men, she, men had left her. She was living with a man that wasn't her husband. But then she met Jesus. And Jesus changed her, not religion. 
And we take that in context and we turn back to our passage today in John 14. Jesus goes on, <coughs> pardon me. He goes on and he says this in verses five through seven. Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, and here's his claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not through church. It's not through karma. It's not through good behavior. It's not through believing that maybe there's good in people because there is not. It is through the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, I am. It's one of the great I am statements, seven great I am statements of Jesus. Jesus, and he says, I am truth. And so when we are in a world today that's doubting what truth is and searching for truth, Jesus says, truth is not something you read. Truth is a person. I am the truth. I am the person of truth. All truth is embodied in me. I am truth. And because I am truth, I can be the way. Because I am God, I am the way. To who? To God the Father. And so because of that, I'm asking you today to consider Jesus. And what he claimed was that, that he was and is the way to God. He's the life that you've been looking for. Bring your doubts, bring your questions, bring your frustrations. But truth isn't an idea. Truth is a person. And because truth is a person, then Jesus is a truth that can actually love you. And because he's without sin, then he has love that will never, ever let you down. And that's why I will declare with you with every bit of faith that I have that Jesus is the name above every name. And at his name, one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so if you wonder... What is the meaning of life? Am I too bad for God? I would invite you, I would invite you to consider Jesus today, not the church, but Jesus. I told you we visited the Billy Graham Library this week. One of the quotes that he had was, if there's any doubt where you will spend eternity, he said, I wouldn't leave here without settling it. And so my encouragement to you is if you do not know Christ today, that you would not leave here without settling it. And if you do know Christ today, let's consider what we are communicating. If you're full of doubt today, we want you to know we're glad you're here. We want to talk more with you about it. Get it? Good, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your truth today. Thank you that you are Lord and Savior. I pray for anyone today that may not know you as their savior. I pray that they would take a step of faith today, not toward a religion, not toward something that will just make them better, not something that will just help them. Those are too, way too limited, Lord. But they would understand that you transform them spiritually, that, that you knew them before the beginning of time, that you created them in your image, that you new sin would come and that in your plan that you would offer your son God Jesus to be a sacrifice for our sin where all of your justice all of your fury all of your wrath would be wrapped up and placed on him for a time so that we would avoid it so that we could be free from the weight of sin that we could know that we're going to be in heaven because we know that you are the way the truth and the life and I pray Lord that you would transform us today if there be anybody here that does not know you, I pray in your name that they would trust you through faith today. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you, God. Help us to work through the doubts that we have, to bring them honestly and just ask questions and, and then learn together so that we might know the truth of Jesus. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.